Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Bonsoir, welcome, bienvenidos to, to all of you. It's a great pleasure to welcome you at Concordia on a beautiful, snowy Friday afternoon. <laughs> Our event is a hybrid, so some made it in person and others are joining us online from Montreal and Chile. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous encore. In collaboration with the Consul General of Chile in Montreal, we are pleased to present to you today the documentary Soy la Tierra, Historias desde el fin del mundo, followed by a panel discussion as mentioned by my colleague Jacqueline. Le documentaire est important en soi. Au-delà de la production sur laquelle je ne peux pas me prononcer, le documentaire souligne des solutions innovantes de Chiliens aux défis reliés à la durabilité. Showcasing the documentary at Concordia today sends two additional strong messages. One, it highlights the importance of sustainability at Concordia. We still have many milestones to cross, but we are trying our best to ensure sustainability is at the heart of everything we do. Thanks to great Concordia faculty, students, and staff that are real champions in this area. The second message is a reflection on the solid relations between Concordia and Chile. And for that, I cannot thank enough the Consul General of Chile in Montreal, Mr. Felipe Orgliana, who has been a real champion also for building bridges between Concordia, Montreal, and Chile. Thank you, Consul General, dear Felipe, for on behalf of the whole Concordia community. <laughs> on the Concordia side, I want to thank my colleague, Julio Sevilla, and the wonderful uh, team at Concordia International and for Space for their continuous support to strengthen our connections globally with Chile in particularly and showcasing the great work that is happening at Concordia. So our event will be divided in three parts. The welcoming remarks, I'm wrapping up, don't worry, screening the documentary film and third part is a panel discussion. For now, we continue with the remarks and it is my pleasure to invite the Consul General of Chile, Mr. Felipe Orleana for his remarks, Felipe, please. Bonjour à tous, chers amis de Concordia, um, queridos compatriotas que están aquí presentes, acompañándonos. Je suis heureux uh, d'être ici au Force Space uh, pour uh, ma première fois. J'espère que no es la dernière. <laughs> Et, très reconnaissant à l'Université de Concordia de l'opportunité de profiter uh, de sa magnifique uh, installation. Uh, qui me permet uh, de partager avec uh, vous uh, toute la personne uh, présente et, et ici et virtuellement, uh, la première à Montréal uh, du documentaire chilien Je suis la Terre. I have to start by expressing uh, the, the most gratitude of the Consulate General of Chile. To, to William and through you to uh, President Carr um, and to all Concordia faculty for its trust, friendship, you mentioned it, and uh, also all the support um, given to, to the screening of, of this film. Minister Rojas, our, our Minister for Environment, uh, was meant to be here uh, giving these greetings, uh, but I knew duties, I was explaining it before, um, working on hard on the negotiations at, at COP15. Um, well, uh, changed her plans and, and she couldn't be here, fortunately. Um, well, Montreal uh, has, uh, over the past uh, few days, become uh, the world capital for biodiversity, uh, welcoming thousands and thousands, I think close to 20,000, uh, delegates from all corners of the world, including government officials, NGOs, women scientists, academia, indigenous, and youth representatives, among others. All of them are here to reach an ambitious agreement that reflects a collective effort 
to preserve biodiversity and, for sure, our precious planet Earth. Chile has embraced the protection of environment as a key priority in the design and the implementation of public policies at all levels. Climate action, along with multilateralism, are at the core of our foreign policy and therefore Chile is committed and fully supporting the adoption of a post-2020 biodiversity framework and doing our utmost for a successful COP15. Back to the film. Our appreciation to Fundación Imagen de Chile for coming up with the idea of making this documentary to showcase different initiatives taken by local communities all over our long and diverse country to tackle climate change. A, a nuestra comunidad, por supuesto, un pequeño saludo. Gracias por acompañarnos. La verdad es que especialmente hoy día con tanta nieve eh, es, eh, se reconoce más todavía el esfuerzo. Uh, lo decía, la ministra quiso venir. Era su intención acompañarnos. Pero el compromiso de de el gobierno de Chile eh, con el medio ambiente obliga que ella esté eh, en primera línea, digamos, para, para tratar de sacar adelante la negociación. Así que cumplo con enviarle el saludo que, que me pidió que les transmitiera y, eh, y espero que, que, que se sientan, sorry for, for, for Spanish, que se sientan orgullosos eh, con las historias que son relatadas en el documental. Eh, ellas reflejan la firme voluntad, la firme decisión de nuestro pueblo de contribuir con, con lo que se encuentra a mano para alcanzar y poder preservar nuestro entorno. Finally, some last words of appreciation to those who in only a few days, a very few days, made this screening possible in such a timely opportunity. First of all, to Julio Sevilla. Thank you so much. Also to, sorry, well deserved. Also to Daniela Montes uh, from Fundación Imagen de Chile, um, to Douglas and Anna from Force Space, uh, to the moderator and the panelists that help us today to, to do this uh, fantastic uh, screen. And uh, now, I will leave you uh, with a pre-recorded uh, message from Jimena Baeza from Fundación Imagen de Chile, who will tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, this uh, documentary. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Jimena Baeza, Head of Marketing at Imagen de Chile. We are in charge of developing strategies and different ways to tell the world about Chile. It's a pleasure for us to be in this important spotlight provided by the Concordia University and Chile's embassy in Canada through our consulate in Montreal. The title of the film is I am the Earth and it's the result of an invitation we made to an exceptional group of Chilean filmmakers to tackle a global and urgent subject, climate change. We are very proud and happy to have had the opportunity to work with such a talented and committed film team led by Fabula as the production company and Maite Alverdi, Maria Paz González, Santiago Correa and Sebastián Fernández, very exceptional directors that made this story come to life. The film tells the story of incredible people that are developing real solutions to contribute to the world in this urgent subject. We believe that this is a huge step to raise awareness about climate change and propose innovative solutions that inspire the rest of the world to act in this very urgent topic. So I will leave you with I am the Earth. We hope it inspires you to learn more about Chile and his people and share our passion for producing real changes to create a better future together. Thank you very much. Enjoy the film. I now invite uh, the moderator and the panelists to come and join us. Moderator, Dr. Eliane Obalijoro. Uh, she's the executive director of sustainability in the digital age and the global uh, uh, hub uh, uh, director for Future Earth uh, uh, Canada. 
Uh, the panelists, uh, Professor Maximiliano Velo, Global Fellow, Latin American Program, Wilson Center, and Consultant on International Ocean uh, Policy, who's joining us, yes, online, and Dr. Rebecca Titler, um, uh, faculty at the, uh, the member and uh, uh, head of the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability uh, at Concordia. Sorry, Maximiliano, I thought you were joining us. Yeah. No, excellent. And uh, Professor Daniela Manuszewicz, head of the Division of Natural Resources and Biodiversity for the Chilean Ministry of the Environment. And Professor, she couldn't join us. Sorry, no problem. Okay. And Professor Christian Sjorsbrun, uh, co founder co founder and CEO. Uh, of Argo Urbana and contributor to the documentary Soy La Tierra. Excellent. So, Elian, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elian. So, it's a real pleasure to be here. I think we all enjoyed this beautiful documentary, um, and it's it's really exciting to be able to talk about the amazing uh, issues that are being brought up by the documentary, given the uh, um, discussions that are happening very close to us here at COP15. So a pleasure to have the three of you with us today. And I just wanted to um, start in terms of um, Christian, uh, you're involved in, in, in this um, filmmaking. What prompted you to make this documentary film? So uh, hi, Elian. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Well, so I, 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 I for, 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 for me and Agro Urbana was, was an invitation to join to this uh, documentary. Um, and I would say that uh, being a Chilean, um, it's a very a huge honor uh, to, to be part of uh, this, uh, this, this story of uh, around this huge concern around climate change. Um, to showcase how Chile it is uh, concerned and committed uh, with the problem, and uh, somehow with through all these stories, I mean, Nairobi is one of them, uh, showing that uh, there is a society down here uh, that is looking for solutions, um, and I think that we just try to um, to show what we're doing, and uh, yeah. Uh, very, very uh, honored to be part of this. So um, I'm just going to ask uh, Maximiliano and Rebecca here, what did you learn from this film that you wish you know everyone knew about? Is this working? Okay, great. Um, I was so struck by how beautiful this film was first. Uh, it was very diverse topics, I felt like, but very hopeful. I was surprised at how hopeful it was. Um, the power of the arts were so strongly uh, demonstrated through this film. And also the power of humanity, the, the, the front facing, honest eyes to the camera um, narrations were so striking. I, I'm a scientist by training. I teach students across disciplines here at Concordia. Um, and I I, I am always telling students that we need to work together. We need to work together. The scientists need to work with the artists. We need to collaborate across disciplines. And, and, and this is an, a perfect example of, of why and how we can reach people. Um, so that's, a, I know it wasn't one of the main messages that the film was trying to get across, but for me, it's really something that, that struck me uh, strongly was a beautiful example of this collaborations and how effective they can be. Thank you. Um, you know, I um, first of all, I mean, I mean, I live in Washington D.C. Uh, nobody's perfect, <laughs> and uh, and so I I miss my uh, my country to begin with. I miss Patagonia. I kind of like I feel you know every time I see some images, it make, almost make me cry because I really miss the forest. I I miss this and the the, the connection, no, the connection the connection you probably have with the things that seem seems to be so obvious every day but then when you don't have them also and they're they're somewhere they're still there kind of 
you know, makes you think about where you are, where you come from. Uh, so that's one thing. But what I like is, is this kind of overview first at the beginning also on, on saying this this is the planet. And, and, and I hear the other day, you know, something, and, and I was thinking about this, everything that happens to you, every happiness moment, every single sadness moment, every bottle, plastic bottle that we consume, every, you know, war that we fought, every person who have lived and die have happened in this tiny little fragment floating in the space. All of that that seems to be so obvious, it's been happening in this place and it's not going away anywhere else. It's just there. And we still fail to understand the fragility of that. We are not taking good care of planet, of this planet, which is the only place where all of that happens and could happen still in the future if we maybe do something. But I think that the message through, you no, know, like we can actually change that because we have to change it because we are the ones who have actually been creating that change for bad. We can transform into something good for sure. So yeah. Thank you, Maximiliano. You're reminding me yesterday, I was with an indigenous colleague from the Northwestern Territories, uh, and he was working from his um, worldview. He was saying how in his uh, worldview that Mother Earth is an island in the sea of the universe, and that we are the caretakers of this island. And so, Christian, I want to just come back to you and ask you in terms of making this movie what are the takeaways you were hoping that people would get from watching this movie well i think first of all uh, is to take conscience about the climate change uh, i think this is affecting chile and everywhere in the world but uh in particular i would say that um to somehow highlight um the diversity that uh, we have in Chile, uh, in terms of the climate, we have desert, we have Mediterranean areas, we have ice fields, we have Patagonia. And I think that we, as a, as a country, uh, can be sort of a lab to, to somehow learn and measure how this is happening. And, um, but among of all these, I mean, problem that we're all facing, I think that a takeaway is that there is a generation of uh, people around the world, in this case in Chile, who are concerned and um, at different scales try to address uh, this problem and try to um, uh, add to the solution, right? Uh, in the case of Agurbana, in my back, you can see what looks like a vertical farm. Uh, my background, I come from the renewable energy. I spent 10 years of my career developing solar projects. And I uh, was part of this um, transformation of the energy grid uh, in Chile. Uh, we passed from, by in 2010, having no capacity of solar. Uh, and today we have multiple gigawatts of capacity and uh, very proud to say that in Chile today, 45% of the energy that we are getting to the grid, it's coming from renewable energy. And that just happened in less than 10 years, right? So I think that when public policy and there is a will in the country to go into um, um, doing things differently uh, and taking advantage of technologies, uh, huge steps can be done. And on top of that, Chile, has already pledged but that by 2030, we will achieve 70% renewable energy, right? So um, coming from that sector, energy, and uh, sort of uh, uh, being part of that transition, I start to think, okay, now we have a, a, a huge amount of renewable energy, which is competitive, which is reliable, which is um, um, clean, of course. So, what can we do now with that energy, right? 
and uh, with my heart, you know, being an entrepreneur, um, I start, you know, looking, okay, uh, I want to sit on the other side of the table. So instead of developing and selling energy, it's already there. What can we do that to unlock things that in the past was not possible? And I came to vertical farming, right? So I'm sort of, you know, trying to um, also take the energy sector to understand this opportunity of using clean energy to do agriculture, but it's not any kind of a, any, 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 a simple agriculture. I would say it's, a, it's an agriculture that makes more with less. So in vertical farming, we are you doing 100 times more production per square meter than traditional agriculture. We're using 95% less water, right? And we are doing that uh, agriculture where people live, right? So all that carbon footprint, all those thousands of kilometers that you have to move uh, um, produce from the farm to the city, now we can do it in very short time. So we, we lower also the, the impact of transportation, the energy consumption on transportation, and uh, we get with a way fresher product, which also helps to lower the waste. So thank you very much, Christian. It, it's very helpful to, to put in context that 70% of the water used on the planet is used for agriculture. So being able to reduce water consumption to such a low level is really critical when we're thinking about future water scarcity. And also you're highlighting the importance of the private sector. Here at COP15, there have been amazing discussions around how the private sector can work towards a nature positive um, net zero world. And I think what you're doing is an excellent example of how private sector can take action in this space. And it also highlights some of what's been happening around 400 companies uh, that uh, produce more than a trillion dollars a year in GDP around the world have asked to be regulated because they want regulations to put in place to encourage all private sector to do the kind of work, Christian, you're doing really around how do we have a nature positive net zero economy everywhere on the planet and in the context of how do we build regenerative economies. So Christian really highlighted the private sector role. So I'm just going to come to you, Rebecca, and to you, Maximiliano, and say, how do you see the roles of academia and think tanks in terms of your perspectives and the work you both do, and maybe also on the policy side, given your advisory role with government, uh, Maximiliano? OK, I'm, I'm going to start the same. And I, I think it's, um, I mean, there's, um, there's a critical role, of course, the society, civil society, have to play in all of this. No? And, and I think it's also um, Chile is a little bit of an experiment many times. You know, <laughs> we we've been functioning as like that's capitalism, you know, function. <laughs> that's that's maybe other sort of ideas. That's you know, new constitution. I think it's a, you know we we sort of um, a, a, a small um, experiment in a way, but at the same time, it's also with, with the the. I feel like we have no fear to kind of also face all of these changes too. Um, just to mention that and, and how civil society has been bringing many of those things. Uh, what Christian was saying, for example, on, 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 on the changes that have happened in, uh, in, in the infrastructure of energy, but also in conservation. And when we are now talking here in, uh, in COP15 no, about the 30% of uh, protection of, uh, of, uh, um, of the world, uh, Chile already have 42% uh, protected in the ocean. It's one of the highest percentage on earth and it's highly and fully. I mean, it's a quality, very good quality of marine protected areas. You have 22 of land protected, you know? So, so Chile is ahead of all of these things, no? And, and, and actually that example of, a, of a developing countries, some, sometimes it's even more important because, you know, the question is like, oh, it, it kind of should be easier for countries who have money, maybe, maybe not, uh, but we prove it. It is possible and it's, it's kind of like the way to, to go. But I think that particular thing is, is actually a combination of things where society has been expressing, and you've seen it two years ago, there was a huge, you know, um, I would say, you know, a revolution pretty much um, in Chile, which also, you know, happened in many other places around uh, in the world. But civil society has always been very present. 
um, in all of these changes. And, and I think that is the biggest sort of part of the example of, of what Chile can do and maybe could eventually teach other places for sure and on Earth too. Well, academia is an easier one for, for me. I mean, I think our role is pretty clearly in research and obviously education. Um, we, we heard from a number of researchers in the film. Uh, academia is supposed to lead, by example. Um, we are also supposed to be the safe spaces for innovation, um, to support innovation, to support discussion, to support um, shifting the paradigms. Um, to support asking the hard questions, provide that space. Um, we need to inspire and support the inspiration that our students bring to us. I'm a firm believer that many of the best ideas come from young minds, uh, and we certainly need those moving forward. Um, so we have a very clear role in, uh, in supporting innovation and supporting, and I don't just mean technological innovation, of course, I mean social innovation, economic innovation in, in, in all ways, uh, innovation in thought. Um, we also have a role to play in terms of developing collaborations and cooperative uh, abilities among our students, among our colleagues in uh, building functional networks and supporting um, progress towards addressing these, these wicked problems. Um, so I would, I would say that's pretty straightforward <laughs> in terms of, of what we do every day. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to go back to you, Christian. So in, in the documentary really highlights transformation through community work. But at the same time, we also live in a world where there's still a lot of apathy. How do you see the type of work you've done with this documentary helping us deal with this issue of apathy around the world? Uh, I would, I will, I would maybe take this question by uh, highlighting one of the big challenges that we have in us as a humanity. Uh, by 2050, we will be close to 10 billion uh, people in the in the planet, and uh, according to the projections, to feed that population, we will have to increase increase by 70 percent the food production that we had in the 2010. So if you take in consideration climate change, water scarcity, earth degradation, in the last 40 years, we lost one third of arable land. Uh, migration from uh, um, countryside to, to the uh, urban areas. So the, if we continue doing things uh, as we were used to do uh, in the past, uh, the equation won't work, right? So we start, we need to start uh, thinking about doing things differently, doing more with less, right? And I think that that's, that's where, this is what we are uh, focused on Agribana, embracing technology um, to put it at the service for the agriculture, right? Uh, now, you mentioned about uh, small scale and community um, um, agriculture. I think that if, if you see, think about, we have to increase by 70% food production. I think we need all of everything. I mean, traditional agriculture, greenhouse, community agriculture. I mean, everything adds to this huge problem that we will have. And if on top of that, you take in consideration in many areas uh, in the world, the, the, uh, the fruits and vegetable uh, intake, it's way below what the uh, World Health Organization recommends. For example, in Latin America, uh, um, the consumption of, of, uh, of fresh produces, uh, it's below 50%. And we have a, a generational change, right? In which well-being and uh, uh, health, it's one of the priorities. So, Eventually, we'll need even more food to produce. And I think that here, uh, everything adds. Uh, in our case, we think that to get to achieve a competitive, affordable products, um, scale is really important. I mean, economies of scales make a huge impact. And what we're doing in Agribana is not sort of a niche product. I mean, our vision and our what we are working for every day, it's, it's optimizing on technology, 
and in yields and in using different crops to be able to lower, lower, lower the cost so it can be uh, um, uh, an affordable product, not only for those that can pay for it, right? And we're confident and we're very close in Chile with technology that we have been developing through the learning. I mean, we have been running this facility, a pilot farm uh, for close to four years. We have learned a lot and uh, we're very close to be competitive uh, with the traditional agriculture. Uh, and our view is that if we can make vertical farming competitive in, a, in the developing world, right? Uh, like in Chile, which on top of that, we have Mediterranean climate with the best conditions for agriculture. If we can make it compete here in Chile, we can do it everywhere. So we are not the solution. We are part of the solution. And that's what we are working for every day. Thank you very much, Christian. You really highlighted a lot of things. You highlighted the, the soil degradation around the world. A third of soils are degraded around the world. And the FAO has stated that if we continue the way we are going in terms of soil degradation, we only have 60 seasons of growing uh, food on the planet. And so this is a serious issue that we need to be uh, mindful of and really think about the importance of healthy soils. You also highlighted the importance of nutrient dense food. So how do we ensure that people have food systems that are really ensuring uh, sustainable livelihoods and good nutrition for all. We live in a world where 3 billion people on the planet are food insecure, and we need to produce even more food uh, to meet the needs of the population by 2050. And you, so you've talked about the issues on land. So Maximilia, I'd like to go to you in terms of oceans and, and the, the blue economy. Where do you see uh, are the current challenges and the places that are neglected as we, uh, you know, move from COP27 to COP15, how are oceans being looked at? And do you think we're giving uh, the blue economy and oceans enough attention? If you look at the, uh, the those pictures now, looking at the from the space of this planet, do you see that actually this planet is ocean? I mean, this planet should call ocean, not Earth. And, and a matter of fact, it covers over 70% of, of this planet. And then if you think like Osvaldo, you know, he's a good, great friend. Um, you know, all the depth of, of, of this planet, biggest diversity on Earth is actually coming, I mean, it is in the ocean. But currently we have this triple crisis, no, that is affecting the ocean uh, in, in, in particular, I would say. It's the, the pollution, it's the, um, the climate change, which, you know, um, creates this warming of the water, which have less oxygen, um, and, and, and many other processes as, as well as we know, as education um, of, uh, of ecosystem, etc. But also, we know the most important actually um, threat to the ocean is the loss of biodiversity. So, so this convention is particularly um, important for oceans. However, oceans are never present on these discussions. Uh, just on the um, the COP25, actually, was Chile who brought it finally the ocean into the agenda. The, during 25 years, the the climate change um, discussions never actually considered the most important part of the, of the planet, which is the ocean, where you know most of the oxygen has been produced, the, the biggest sort of uh, uh, mitigation factor of the planet, etc. And we keep thinking on the ocean in a way that we can extract. Remember, wildlife, the, the biggest wildlife trade on Earth is from the ocean. Those species that we're taking are no different than a jaguar, you know, a tuna. They're just wildlife that we're taking out of the water is being produced by the, by the ocean. We have not farmed those um though you know we haven't produced those tuna those tuna are basically thanks to thanks to the ocean and so we keep looking at the ocean as a kind of endless source of 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 food and i keep hearing for example like, you know most important source of protein but the most important thing that actually we extract from oceans is our own existence and we fail constantly to remember that it's not about economy it's not about numbers of how good the economy that we how much we actually produce from the ocean it's about life itself if we don't have a healthy ocean there's no healthy humanity mm -hmm. there's no good jobs there's no good economy 
there's nothing. And so I think the most important is how actually, how do we bring all of that? And we take care of this leading you know, system that has been so good to us so far to basically being here, you know, talking. Thank you very much, Maximiano. So Rebecca, given all of these challenges, <laughs> how do you see the work being done at Concordia and, and what you're leading and, and the colleagues in terms of the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, what are the initiatives you'd like to highlight that are working on any of the challenges that we're discussing today? Yes, um, there's lots going on. I'm also involved with the Loyola Sustainability Research Center, which is a network of researchers here at Concordia, uh, working across disciplines on sustainability. So one of our, our main focuses is really on developing those relationships across disciplines. Um, which among our students at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, and at the faculty level as well, so that we can collaborate uh, across the disciplines, which are, are crucial to address any of these sustainability, any of the wicked problems of the world. Really, we can't talk about biodiversity uh, just among us biologists. So, you know, we'll have great conversations, but we won't lead to any action. <laughs> Right? We need to get the artists involved and the, those who, who know how to develop policy and who know how to talk to other people. <laughs> Not that scientists don't, but um, uh, so that's some of the you know, general work that we're doing here at Concordia, inspiring young minds, of course, we hope to always. Um, we also have some very particular research projects, some of which you're involved in with Damon Matthews and the Leeds project, for example, um, that are looking at, uh, at, at, at climate, climate change initiatives and uh, um, we have some projects that are looking at, uh, we have a few, uh, quite a few cities related projects that are looking at equitable and just ways to um, develop sustainable cities um, with issues of social equity in mind, as well as biodiversity and ecosystem services. So we have a number of those uh, going on um, and, uh, and other things as well. A lot of my role is really in relationship building and, and bringing people together across those disciplines to have those conversations. Um, we do a lot here at Force Space, so we invite you to keep track and come back anytime <laughs> to, to see what we're up to. Thank you. So Christian, you're, working in the private sector, but you also worked on producing a documentary. How do you see the role of the arts in terms of moving society, educating society, uh, or influencing policy? Okay. First, I would like to add something to what uh, Maximiliano mentioned before, and uh, also what, uh, in line with uh, what you, Elian, mentioned about the fact that agriculture, it's uh, consuming 70% of the fresh water, right? And it's using the fresh water and not necessarily returning it back uh, in the same conditions. It's coming with a pesticide, with a, a high concentration of uh, fertilizers. And all that goes going back to the water beds, to the rivers, and ultimately to the ocean, right? And uh, in particular in Chile, you have many farmers that uh, are not yet concerned about this impact is not a priority. And I think that there is a lot of still education and accountability that uh, ultimately agriculture will be uh, under you know, the, the focus of the climate change. We have to forget that 20% of, of the greenhouse gases are coming from agriculture and forestry uh, activity, right? That's pretty much the same that is coming from um, the power market. Okay, so I think that agriculture, uh, it's on debt, it has a debt around climate change. So uh, regarding to your question, um, can, can you repeat it? I, I got a little lost with it. <laughs> no, well, I was, I was highlighting the fact that not only are you in the private sector in terms of doing great work at that interface of nature okay. positive um, economies, but also producing a documentary. So. Yeah exploring the role of the arts. And so just wanted to get a sense for you, yeah. how can the arts help us in this uh, space in terms of literacy, in terms of policy change, uh, transforming society? Why the arts? Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and I will go back to what Rebecca mentioned before about the feeling, the emotions that uh, uh, this kind of documentary and arts can um, are creating people. Um, I think that really, with, with the with the 
with the images and the story and the, 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 the narrative, I think that it's really inspiring. The first time that I, I, I watched the documentary, uh, my tears were, were coming down. It was really, really uh, emotional, uh, uh, what, what creates. So I think that through these kind of activities, um, you create an impact in, in people. And uh, people start uh, really taking serious uh, all these topics as climate change, uh, seeing uh, this kind of initiative as um, game changers. Um, and they will start seeing things differently. Maybe um, when buying a product, uh, really thinking what's behind that product, who made that product, how it did it, and which, what impact created into the planet, right? Just by seeing that image of bottles uh, floating in the ocean, uh, it's terrifying. So uh, I think that the, the arts have a role and uh, definitely when people start really taking seriously this, this will ultimately transform in public demands and ultimately in laws and regulation. Thank you. So you were talking about the floating bottles in the ocean, and it makes me think of a, an initiative that was started here on campus by students. And I just wanted to know, um, Rebecca, if you could talk a bit about this initiative and what does it represent and why it's important? The Zero Waste Project? <laughs> There's a lot going on here at Concordia. We do have a group that is uh, recycling plastic for 3D printing here on campus. Uh, we also have a big zero waste initiative um, that focuses on composting and compost education and also just reducing waste in general here on campus. Again, our, uh, a lot of it um, student led to begin with and student inspired and then, uh, and then driven forward by faculty and staff. Here at Concordia to reduce the waste on campus, we've made huge, um, huge progress in terms of in terms of reducing waste, um, and, and in terms of, of composting, we're recycling masks <laughs> on campus, which was wonderful. Uh, with the pandemic, we're we're going through so many of them. Um, there have been uh, initiatives where we have had our our trash cans taken out of our offices. <laughs> um, and some of my colleagues have have. Um, Getting, gotten some flack for that, but it, it makes us think about, you know, if we need to go down the hall uh, to find the, the trash can, do we do we really need to create that trash? You know? <laughs> um, little things like that have, have made have made quite a difference here on campus, as well as the, the work of the uh, Waste Not Want Not compost campaign that really worked hard um, to educate and continues to work hard under a, a B Corps version of that uh, student faculty uh, staff led project um, to educate students as they come in, continue to educate faculty and staff on, uh, on our waste imprint and how we can reduce it. Um, we, have, we have issues to address still, <laughs> always. I'm from the Loyola campus where we have a lot more green space and we have issues with our leaves and our management, et cetera. But um, Concordia is a small city. We're learning to, uh, to address our issues communally and uh, in, a, in a collaborative way. Thank you. I think that's a great to highlight, you know, what university campuses can do and how student led initiatives really can work not only to nudge us individually in terms of just having greater consciousness in terms of our actions, but how we can collectively move to a place where the there's a there's a B Corp that was created and that uh, is hopeful to initiate similar initiatives across Canada because Canada has some of the highest waste per capita in the world. So this is a really great initiative in terms of nudging Canada. To Maximiliano, the documentary highlighted international cooperation and the importance of Chile being a center for research. What do you see are avenues that we should explore and what could Canada and, and Chile or, you know, work together on in terms of research that you see would highlight um, the amazing uh, knowledge and, and resources available in Chile right now? Well, I think one of the things, you know, if you look at the map, of course, we're exactly the extremes of this planet no and so we share basically like a kind of geographic uh very similar conditions in in many ways um we have uh, a lot of very isolated population too we have great spaces too we have uh, paragonia you know like incredible um areas as you have also yukon and many others like they're beautiful i still need to visit many of them for sure but 
I think it's, uh, I think that's one first thing is this incredible place that actually still can be protected. We share also a huge diversity on, on also, um, you know, different groups. Uh, we have, you know, um, um, a lot of different indigenous groups through the, through our territory that um, I think we still, there's so much work to do to also, you know, kind of, uh, bring the knowledge and recognize um, a lot of what they they've done where they are what they do, you know what they do etc and 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 i think those things are, are are very similar in many ways um there is there have been also this new kind of uh coming together president trudeau and president boris actually have now become great friends and then they go for a beer and everything and and i think beyond that i think it's it's definitely uh, this kind of uh, also big different. We are a developing country. We've been through very hard times too in democracy and all this, but we have somehow kind of flourished too. And I think there there is this connect connectivity, um, you know, one side to the other of the planet that we can learn from each other. We can support uh, one to each other and we can finally, you know, find solutions and we can be, you know, I, I think it, I'm very proud to see kind of the, this film because it shows how a tiny little country also can maybe teach, whether it's in, in Canada, but how Canada also has been teaching us many things, many aspects, you know, I, I think, um, you know, humility is, 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 is a huge important part of it. And I think, um, I think Chile and Canada are kind of like this so sort of low profile countries that can maybe do some work in silent but actually can do a lot of advance on that i just want to add that i think that it's obvious that we can learn a lot from you about our conservation of our oceans to start with 42 so percent yeah, no, i i, <laughs> I do agree there is a lot in in canada that need to be done in terms of uh, marine protection sadly still um they're they're far from it but I th we've seen a lot of uh, moving forward and just uh, recently i don't know if you know a few months ago actually um uh, chile and canada sort of um put forward a, a declaration that it was signed basically for most of the American uh, countries to create a corridor of marine protected areas from Patagonia to Alaska. And, and, and the two countries actually that have been pushing for that has been the, these two countries. So I think there is a desire. Um, we've been talking a lot about with the authorities. I, I work actually for, with Sylvia Earle. If you, don't, if you don't know her, you should look for her. Um, uh, that's part of my job, and so we're always looking at uh, Canada, how we can advance some more marine protection for sure. Thank you. I, 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 the documentary Christian highlighted uh, issues around energy. Can you speak to us? Why was it so important for you to highlight those issues? And if you had any particular um, favorites in terms of what was highlighted around energy? Well, um, I don't see a long-term um, sustainable food future for, in this case, vertical farming, if it is not hand-by-hand uh, hand with renewable energies. Um, what we do in, in, in vertical farming is that we create the optimal conditions um, for plants to grow better, right? So we control temperature, we control humidity, CO2, uh, and we provide uh, a light, the, the, a light spectrum and light intensity, which is specifically designed for the, the crops that we are growing. So the, the, the consumption of energy, it's relevant, right? And uh, it won't work for us uh, if it is not, uh, if it's coming from a, a cold uh, facility, right? Um, in Chile, the, the energy market, uh, when you are a large um, consumer of energy, allow you to go directly to the power generators to contract energy. So you can structure those power purchase agreement to be 100% renewable, right? And that's, that's kind of the base uh, 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 for us uh, when we see energy. And uh, I would also add, um, and this is what, what I, I pretty much live uh, uh, while I was working in the power sector, that uh, thanks to the regulation and the introduction of renewable energy, particular, I would say developing countries 
uh, can adopt uh, faster renewable technologies than developed countries, right? Because we have a, a, a growing uh, uh, demand of energy, which is steeper than developed countries. And uh, if you set the right public policies, uh, you can uh, uh, accelerate that uh, adoption. And just to give you an example, um, when I, I enter into the power sector, uh, trying to, at the beginning, to evangelize the, the, the market and, 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 and in particular convince large of takers of energy, which are mining sector in Chile, to bet on renewable energy, the, um, the prices of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, the energy price of solar at that time was around $150 per megawatt hour, right? But uh, in 2016, solar was betting on, on public auctions at below $40 a megawatt hour. And if you see how the, 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 the evolution of uh, the clearing price of the auctions in, in Chile, in 2013, the clearing price were around $120 per megawatt hour. Four years later, the clearing prices were uh, going down to $35. So uh, overall, the impact of the fast adoption of renewable energy uh, um, uh, impacted the, the energy prices and by 45% in just five years, right? And I think that um, energy enables a lot of things, right? Um, and, and in this case, it's allowing us to do more with less and using only 1% of the land that you will use to produce the same amount of vegetables than in, in traditional ways. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we know that uh, energy transition is a difficult one and, and a really important one. I think you really highlight the importance of how it can be done and the importance of how innovation is critical to moving us forward in terms of doing this well. And, and we know today that there are still uh, subsidies in trillions of dollars that go to uh, energy sources that are, are non-renewable, that uh, produce greenhouse gases, and that in order to transition us, we know that the equivalent of how much money we put in those, those subsidies could go into financing the sustainable development goals. So we still have a lot of work in terms of shifting those subsidies. And we also know that uh, many subsidies that go into harmful agricultural practices need to be shifted to uh, regenerative, to, to more um, energy saving, water saving, uh, less ideally non-polluting agricultural production practices. And so these are very, very critical elements. The documentary really highlighted the tensions and, and the, the urgent needs that we need to address, but also the many challenges that we have. So maybe in closing, I just want to ask each of you, it, it's hard sometimes to be hopeful when it comes to matters of the environment. What gives you hope? Rebecca, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. I get this question from my students all the time, usually around midterms time, and then again around finals. How do you get up in the morning? Uh, and I and I tell them quite honestly that what gives me hope is them. It is true. Um, I'm a biologist by training. Humans are big-brained, naked apes. Our big brains help us to solve problems. Uh, we are natural problem solvers, but uh, more importantly, perhaps, we are natural collaborators and cooperators. Humans are by nature social, and we know from what we know of other animals that are social, um, we are hardwired to work together. Um, I believe that humans are fundamentally decent. The average human on the street is fundamentally decent and wants to do good, um, despite what we read in the news <laughs> about everything that is terrible. Um, so we have seen today some innovative solutions to some problems. There is not going to be one single solution to all of our problems unless it is collaboration and cooperation um, for which we are evolved really fundamentally we have not gotten to where we are any of us uh, without collaborating with each other without learning from one generation to another um, and that's yeah there's no one single thing apart from human nature <laughs> Just, you know for better or for worse but collaborative thank you maximiliano um so I, I, I mean, I think the first, the first thing that comes to my mind is the, is the fact that we have the information. You know, now we know, because we we could be maybe damaging the whole planet, and maybe we wouldn't 
even have idea. Like we actually, we had, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago even. Now we know we have been affecting the ocean. We have been affecting the atmosphere of this planet. We know the problem. So then we can actually take action. So I think that gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot of hope to see a lot of young people, you know, taking, taking the microphone, um, doing um, different things, taking action. I think that reaction or actually using the power for, of knowledge to, to say like, I, now I know this is happening, now I'm going to do something about it. It's critical. But the most important is that we still have a living system. We still have kind of like the, all the components that are needed for this planet to continue doing what it does, which is providing life. So we have lost, you know, some of the shark species, 99%, 1% remaining. But thank God we still have 1%. No, <laughs> you know, so I, I prefer to see the, the full glass actually of this and, and to think that this planet still have those components so we can bring them back. And we have intelligent people, we have people who cares, we love each other when we want, and we are capable of change. Thank, Thank you. you. Christian, what gives you hope? My hope, it's, I see, I see in the new generations, there is a consciousness around, there is an impact in everything that they do. Um, if you just take millennials, millennials today are, they concentrate 50% of the workforce worldwide. And they are changing the market preference. The way to vote what is good and what is bad is by choosing what they are going to put in their mouth, right? Uh, so it's not just about price, about quantity. It's about the story, right? And they're a very educated generation. They read labels way more than any previous generation. And uh, they want to know who did it, how it did it, and which impact uh, created on the, on the environment. So I see that uh, in, in, in our team, for example, in Agribana, um, a bunch of young guys, super motivated. Uh, they're not looking for salaries or traditional jobs, security and you know, stable jobs. I mean, they're willing to take the risk uh, and, and uh, sacrifice their salaries to go back home and say, hey, I am doing something that uh, is contributing to make a better world. And I think that that, that is, it's, it's growing, right? Uh, and that is also challenging. The private sector is challenging governments to take real action on this. No more bullshit. They want to see action. And uh, they're really into that. Thank you, Christian. I'd like to just thank oh, my pan, my few panelists. This has been really exciting. It's been a beautiful movie. And everything all of you have talked about makes me think of uh, one of the challenges we face. And, and it's really highlighted, Christian, but what you said in terms of the young people and their aspirations today. It's really this idea is they're not just looking for a paycheck. They're looking for places where they can build human capitals with their own capacities, where they can build social capital and where they can contribute to natural capital. And so it's really, how do we move forward in a society that considers nature for all that it gives us? We know that every year, the World Economic Forum has says that it's about $1.8 trillion of value that we, come from, that we get from nature. And right now, in terms of our accounting systems, we're not considering that. And so the importance of how are we gonna look at accounting, as we move forward, we have the International Sustainability Standards Board that has established itself in Montreal. We have the great work being happening here at Concordia. We have this great relationship between Canada and Chile that we have highlighted. And I just want to say muchas gracias. Thank you, merci beaucoup, miigwech, and wishing everyone online a safe weekend here in Canada. We know that here in Montreal, there's a lot of snow. It's a little bit slippery. And for all of you who braved the snowstorm to come here with us today, uh, there's some refreshments and we look forward for you to enjoy them and meet each other and mingle and have a safe journey back home and have, enjoy your weekend. So thank you everyone.